Hello and welcome to Week in Review with me, Jane Secker, Kevin Maguire and Andrew Pearce are here to look back at the biggest stories of the last seven days. Uh, what have been your top stories of the week? For me, it's that horrible football manager, Sam Allardyce. Uh, thank God he's resigned. Kevin? Yeah, it's got to be the Labour conference and Jeremy Corbyn's rather good speech on 21st century socialism. You must okay. have been at a different conference. <laughs> no, I think you were. Mm. Well, more on both of those stories in a second, but first let's get a taste of what the week was all about. Tributes were paid to the former Israeli Prime Minister Shimon Peres, who died at 93. He won the Nobel Peace Prize with Yitzhak Sakrabin and the then Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat back in 1994 for his role in negotiating the Oslo Peace Accords. The beleaguered inquiry into historic allegations of child sex abuse suffered another blow after one of its lead counsels, Ben Emerson, was suspended, then resigned. A court ruled that controversial new contracts for junior doctors were legal. The owners of Alton Towers Merlin Entertainment were fined £5 million pounds over the accident on the Smiler roller coaster last June. 16 people were injured, including two teenagers who both lost a leg. Golfing legend Arnold Palmer died, aged 87. He was widely credited with bringing the sport to the masses. A baby was born with the DNA of three parents for the first time. The child, named Abraham, was born in Mexico using a technique developed in the UK. And the £1 billion pound Rosetta spacecraft was deliberately crashed into a comet to bring its more than a decade-long mission to an end. Well, tributes far and wide this week for Shimon Peres. He did, of course, uh, help the Palestinians and Israelis get as close as they've probably ever come to a peace process. Yeah, a hugely important figure. And um, it, it's it, the fact that the, the cast list at the funeral reflects that. Um, Clinton's there, Obama was there, Prince Charles went for us. And um, he was a hugely significant figure, won the Nobel Peace Prize. And um, the Oslo Accord was a huge breakthrough. Yeah, I think the assassination by an Israeli of Yitzhak Rabin was a terrible moment in the history of that country. But he was also accused by, uh, of war crimes by by Palestinians, so he was he was quite a controversial figure. I, controversial, I met but, him. But ne nevertheless, Mahmoud Abbas, you know, did come to yep. his funeral, and there oh, was no, a Palestinian absolutely. delegation in, in recognition of, of how yeah. close they, they got. Mm -hmm. And there was there was a, a wisdom in him un unquestionably, and Israel's lost a link with its foundation. Yeah. Okay. Now, this week saw a blow to the reputation of football in England. An investigation by the Daily Telegraph resulted in allegations of corruption at several levels of the game. But chief among them was Sam Allardyce. He left his post as England manager after just 67 days in charge. After being filmed apparently trying to broker a deal worth hundreds of thousands of pounds and telling businessmen how to evade strict third-party rules on ownership, a practice banned by FIFA since May 2015. A warning, some flash photography coming up. I don't know whether he's broken any rules or not because the FA disciplinary department will investigate the allegations, look at the evidence and make a decision. The issue for us was one of an employee's behaviour and whether he could carry on as England manager having said some of the things he'd said on, a, uh, on, a, on television. Uh, and he admitted that uh, that, that behaviour was foolish, he put his position in jeopardy and we discussed it and he decided to move on and we support that. But once again it wasn't about his performance as England manager. On reflection. It was a silly thing to do, but um, just to let everybody know, I sort of helped out what was a somebody I'd known for 30 years, and unfortunately it was an error in judgment on my behalf, and uh, I paid the consequences. But, um, you know, entrapment has won on this occasion, and uh, I have to accept that. Um, the agreement was done uh, very amicably with the FA. Uh, Apologise to those, and all concerned that was in those un unfortunate situations I've put myself in. So a certain amount of mea culpa, but, but also blaming entrapment. I mean, do you uh, think it was entrapment or do you think it was greed? No, I think it was greed. You're on three million a year, the lure of another 400,000. You're willing to talk about how you can get around transfer rules, how get around the rules operated by your employer, by the FA. And he looked a pretty broken man there, unshaven. Uh, Kind of, you know, not oh, far on, from he was, tears, he was heading I off to his, his posh villa. You yeah, that much sympathy for oh, him. Oh, no, he's, he's got that. No, I think he's the author of his uh, own downfall. Uh, unquestionably, uh, he was absolutely stupid and he was greedy and he was reckless. He has nobody to blame but, but himself. Uh, so, you know, he can go on, a, he can whinge as much as he likes, he can be as sick as a parrot how it happened, but it was his fault. I Gary Lineker, this, this yeah. week called for a real examination of, of football and, and corruption within it. Do you think we need that? Yeah, we do, because the FA and others in the English League, Football League have said that they've already got the powers they need to, to root out corruption. Well, they haven't. 
because uh, the Telegraph is expo revelations come day by day, exposing more and more wrongdoing in football. We've known for a long time that there's too much money in there and that p dodgy deals are being done. And when it's the England manager at the pinnacle of the game, mm. it says so much, doesn't it? And it's outrageous he's blaming entrapment. He's just gr a greedy, grasping man, and he's, a sh he brought, he's brought shame on football, and not for the first time is football in the doghouse. And let's say it here as well, too, for journalism. Fantastic scoop for the Daily Telegraph. Oh, fantastic fantastic. Legitimate, legitimate entrapment because it's in the public interest. Shame, wherever there are large amounts of money, you will find corruption. Yeah. Uh, OK, well, let's stay with sport uh, for our gaffe of the week. Uh, Sam Allardyce had a few nominations from a lot of you this week, but it's the Ryder Cup this weekend with Europe's top golfers hoping to retain their title in front of some even more hostile American crowds than normal because British star Danny Willett's brother, Peter, has branded American fans as angry, <laughs> unwashed, a braying mob of imbeciles. He also said, we need to get rid of their obnoxious dads with their shiny teeth, Lego man hair, medicated ex-wives and resentful children. Is he talking about Donald Trump? <laughs> well, uh, there is always rivalry, but the Americans aren't very happy about this, and it's meant that the uh, European team had to apologise, and Danny's had to apologise on behalf of his brother. I, I think it's extraordinary. I think, of course, the real reason the Americans are cross is because Danny won the US Masters, didn't he? Uh, nicked the trophy from them, and we keep winning the Ryder Cup too, and I hope we win it yeah. again. Uh, uh, it's a t it, I think it's hilarious. They should just get over it. I know, but I think, I think the brother, Peter, who's a drama teacher in Birmingham, has, has overreached himself yeah, here yeah, by yeah. embarrassing his brother. Because he, he, he had a good gained a bit of notoriety during the Masters. Exactly. Well. And, we, and we loved it when his brother won the Masters and he was describing, you know, uh, what life used to be like there and, and so on. That, that was fantastic. But that was positive. But don't then attack... You yeah, know, the country and everyone in it with a with a whole load of let's let's be honest. It's quite funny though. Broad it brush. Funny. It, it, it's, it's broad brush prejudice, though, isn't yeah. it? A lot of the Americans writing back, Brits, you forgot about your bad teeth, your warm beer, your horrible food, <laughs> and then someone else called Rick tweeted him, "We own the UK in every sport. Did you guys ever win a medal at the Olympics?" And uh, Peter uh, Willett well, yeah. tweeted back, uh, "Yes, quite a lot, and we didn't trash any petrol station toilets in the process." Good <laughs> response. That is a corker. <laughs> that Good reply, touché. Yeah. Well, this week, the Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, kept his job with a comprehensive victory over the challenger, Owen Smith, but then had the more difficult task of using his conference speech to try to heal the divides in his party. Our political editor, Faisal Islam, reports from Liverpool. Jeremy Corbyn's main job in Liverpool, to heal Labour wounds. But many MPs didn't even turn up. His rhythmically chanting core supporters, though, witnessed his most confident performance, a Thank systematic you. attack on the government, its policies, values and Theresa May. Who seriously believes that the Tories could ever stand up to the privileged few? They are the party of the privileged few. An external threat to help the leader enforce internal discipline after a fractious conference and leadership contest. No one will be convinced of a vision promoted by a divided party. We all agree on that. So I ask, so I ask each and every one of you to accept the decision of the members, end the trench warfare and work together to take on the Tories. Ramping up the rather uncertain prospect of a snap election is very helpful for the Labour leader as he predicted success in mayoral elections next May. So today we put ourselves on notice. Labour is preparing for a general election in 2017. Yeah. So a pretty comprehensive victory, but the real challenge, of course, is reuniting the party, isn't it? No, it is, absolutely. C clear win within the Labour Party. You've got to unite the Labour Party, and then you've got to win the country, as Sadiq Khan and Tom Watson, the deputy leader in Maryland, London, made clear in their spe uh, speeches. But it was the best public speech I've seen and heard by, by Jeremy Corbyn. And he pressed a lot of the right buttons, you know, lots of policies in it. And he also made clear that he's not just a protest marcher, that he does want to win a general election because his critics have been claiming he was kind of uh, not really that hungry for power. And you've got to want to win power if you're going to change people's lives. You were both obviously up at the conference in Liverpool. What, what did you feel when you were up there, Andrew? What was the mood like? Uh, it was like two conferences. So the MPs... Uh, have become more and more marginalised, and there was off, they were off, there was often they were used as a term of abuse on the conference floor with delegates talking about how parliamentarians no longer represent the voice of the movement. It's all about the movement. Corbyn has captured the Labour Party, but the problem persists. 
how does he make it work with a parliamentary party? Because nothing's changed with that speech. I, I agree with Kevin, he, it was the best delivered speech he's made, but it was full of the most ridiculous left-wing uh, dogma, £500 billion spending boosts and all the rest of it. Uh, and I cannot see how he's going to get parliamentarians coming back to the front bench in any great numbers. And you saw the big players in the Labour Party, like Chukra Amuna, uh, Rachel Roots, on the fringe, nowhere near the main stage. We also we did see Clive Lewis on the main stage, oh, didn't we, Kevin? Yeah. And what was going on there? His speech was altered whilst he was waiting to deliver it by somebody else. Th that's right. He opposed Why? Trident renewal. Uh, now well, he's not he's not for it, but he realises decisions are being taken, and he wanted to say that look, he'll just have to accept it's going to be there, and he won't be going to that conference again to say let's try and change it, just go along with it. And uh, Seamus Milne, the chief spin doctor, changed it, watered it down at the end, and he. Is said to have punched a wall, Clive Lewis, in frustration afterwards. Although well, you I, if you, if you, if you know, got yeah. on the stage thinking you were delivering one speech, yeah. and I asked Clive him to note were told it, you were delivering another. Yeah, I asked him to show me, show me his knuckles. And I inspected them. There was no marks on them, so I don't know what happened to the wall. But he is. <laughs> <laughs> but he, but he, he was maybe a bit tougher than. Yeah, <laughs> but, he, but, he, but I think he was right on a personal level to be to be angry. Right, quick quiz yeah. for you both now. Uh, can you tell me uh, what one of a one in three of us do in bed every night? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. No, no, I think you're a different <laughs> third. Steady on. Uh, do you know at home? We'll find out after the break. <laughs> Welcome back to Week in Review with me, Jane Secker. I'm joined by Kevin Maguire, Associate Editor of The Daily Mirror and Andrew Pearce, Consultant Editor of The Daily Mail. Uh, before the break, we asked, what do one in three of us do in bed every night? It's a family programme. Right, just remember. Stop it. Me... Check our phones. <laughs> Indeed. Check our smartphones. Uh, this is according to a study from Deloitte. A third of us roll over in bed, check our smartphones. Even higher among 18 to 24-year-olds, half admit waking up in the night and checking no. their messages. It's I don't even have my phone in my bedroom. Well done. No, That's no. good. I'm a, I'm a professional journalist, so I do, just in case something big happens. But do you know how we knew it was the mobile phone? Because I had it on the script here in running order, the mobile phone. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, that's a bit of a giveaway. Note to producer, we'll change that for next week. I knew anyway. I'm yeah. keep in touch with the news. I, I did know, but, but, the, it, the but excuse, we were helped there. The excuse that a lot of people give is that they use it as an alarm clock. Yeah. And, yeah. and I do that. That's why yeah. my phone's yeah. by my bed. Because, uh, but actually, they're, my, my, they're urging people to buy an old-fashioned alarm clock. uses his mobile phone as his alarm clock. But it's amazing. I don't have a watch. I don't have a separate alarm clock now. Uh, you don't. You've don't got you a phone. A watch? Well, because you check Excuse the time you on your phone because yeah. you're carrying it. Right. Now, this week, the two candidates in the race for the White House went head to head for the first time. Here's our US correspondent, Greg Milan, with a look back at their clash. For the first time since she was a guest at his last wedding, we saw them on camera together again. First, the smiles, then the insults. This is a man who has called women pigs, slobs, and dogs. She doesn't have the look, she doesn't have the stamina. And for 90 Machado, minutes, Americans pondered one big question. Why was he citizen, sniffing so much? Bet. Our country's in deep trouble. <laughs> anyway, the TV audience was a record 81 million. In an L.A. cinema, they settled down with popcorn to watch the spectacle. The polls said Clinton won. Trump blamed his microphone. My mic was defective within the room. Did I explain the sniffles then? This was his rival's reaction to that. Anybody who complains about the microphone is not having a good night. <laughs> a day later, Trump was claiming victory. It was, it was a fascinating period of time, and I think we did very well. We won virtually every poll, every poll. The day after that, he said this. I will be the greatest president for jobs that God ever created, that I can tell you. While outside, the band played doomy music, and rival supporters had their own debate. If you were here to support these people that's crossing across the border, you think? The candidates will do it twice more before Election Day. What did you think of it? Who do you think did, did Well, she definitely us? won. Yeah. He started off OK, but he, got, he started to ramble. Uh, he interrupted her too much. He was rude. I don't think she was brilliant, actually, but he was just poor. He hadn't done his homework, and he almost made a virtue of it, and he won't be so badly prepared next time. Mm -hmm. and, and I still think, even though he was awful, I don't think she delivered a knockout blow. It made me weep that Cameron chicken out of debates in Britain last time, and I hope if May's still there, Corbyn, whoever, that we see them back in Britain. But he made two big errors. One is he kept interrupting mm. her, uh, which doesn't look, uh, yeah. look good. And, 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 and second, quite kind of grumpy with the interviewer as well, yeah. which also doesn't look good. Well, it's because he was struggling. And the, and the second thing he did, she'd say, call him a racist, and he'd repeat, racist. 
So all her, uh, all her charges, he would repeat them and reinforce them by doing that. I'm sure he will prepare for the next debate, but as a result, he has slipped behind a little bit. It's not decisive, but he yeah. slipped behind in those key states. She's doing better than he is. And she's got a better ground campaign on top yeah. of that. OK, uh, let's take a look at your paper stories. Uh, Andrew, uh, you've gone for the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. They're, of course, in Canada this week, and we got an insight a little bit into the planning of a royal tour. Yeah, the, um, there was a conversation with the Canadian government, which was obviously hugely involved in it. It's taken six months to put this tour together. They're there for seven or eight days. And, and you get some fascinating facts coming to it. They won't fascinate Maguire, of course. No, they're not, actually, it. no. But, um, but like, yeah. they have a Royal Navy docked with them permanently mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, an the, and and the royals are always supplied with their own booze uh, not by the government, mm -hmm. by, by, the, by the royal uh, family. And, what, and what's their tipple? Prince Charles, gin and tonic, uh, a bit like Prin his mother. Prince William. Prince William. Yep. And, 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 and Prince, uh, she's not a princess, just Duchess Cambridge, Cambridge, red wine. I, I was at a do and I noticed uh, Charlie Boy and Camilla had their own wine. Everyone else was sipping it's, something it's to else. Do with, yeah. It's to do with fear of being spiked, apparently. Yeah, they really. say that's what it's, it's a security really. issue. As Rather well. than a bit of snobbery. Did they notice you there. when you were there? Did they no. notice you and say, How are you? Funny enough, I wasn't part of the line up oh. to greet them. <laughs> <Funny laughs> <that. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Kevin, you've this week gone for the investigation to the downing of flight MH17, um, which has provoked quite a few tensions, hasn't it? It has. Dutch prosecutors, I, th I think, proved pretty conclusively yes. <laughs> that yeah. missile had brought it down. Uh, 298 men, women and children killed. Came from Russia, was fired in a Ru Russian part of um, Ukraine, occupied. And yet the Russians are still coming up a conspiracy. Back across the yeah, back yeah. and it was—it looked really good forensic police work. I must say, with pictures and you follow follow it. And of course, the Russians are not going to accept any responsibility. What should happen there is Vladimir Putin has blood on his hands until they come clean. He should be hounded at every international summit and asked for answers. Because this was a comprehensive inquiry. A number of countries yeah. were involved mm -hmm. and of course they talk about, Putin is talking about political bias. Why would there be political bias? I think 12 countries were involved in this inquiry. Yeah, but he could say they're all anti-Russian. Well, uh, it's, it, it's, it's obvious. We knew it anyway, didn't we? Really, deep down, we all knew it was Russia and this is just confirmation. And uh, I think Maguire's got a point, actually, that it should be, he, he should be humiliated right. at every summit until he does admit it. But he won't, of course. Well, hope, he's, an ex -KG, he's not an ex-KGB man for nothing. Yeah, hopefully for the families, you know, they may have found some comfort, yeah. you know, from, from yeah. this, this report. And Andrew, a call for a ban on pet names. So these are not necessarily for everybody. They're the names that women most hate being the, called. And the name women hate most is Bird. Mm. Uh, and bird. Uh, when, I, when I was at school, I can still remember the, the lads talking about she's a hot bird. I don't think they would say it now. Uh, the other words they hate are chick, uh, babe, and dull. High maintenance, hormonal. Yeah. Hormonal is very, very near the top. They might, but they want some of these words banned. How can you ban these words? You, you can't, can't ban these no. words. The, the, the unfortunate thing is that a lot of the words are words that the, they used to describe women, things like bossy. Yeah. And, yeah. and if it's a man, he's not bossy, no, he's exactly. determined. I know. It is um, very, a lot of it is very sexist. Well, they also object to the word drama queen, mm. which I thought was a bit odd. Because yeah, they don't, because I, think, I think that's because it's can be homophobic isn't oh, yeah. it? and I think that's why but, but it someone, also suggests yeah. that your you know your views your you know your your you're expressive about something, you yeah. really care about something, yeah. you're just being a bit hysterical. Well, he's called me drama queen. Yeah. No, I, no, I haven't. Yes, you have. <laughs> no, I've called, you, I've called you a lot worse. Uh -huh. Labour Party cam conference, people used to shout something like, it was like banker, but it wasn't quite that. Anyway, I can't imagine that. what they meant. <laughs> no, no. But, it, but, it, you know, but if people are calling you, what, Northeast pet or hinny, that's love. all right. Yeah, yeah. love or duck. Cock, well, but, yeah. Fred, I do, I'm right. afraid I do yeah. often call my girlfriends darling, and they don't mind. Yeah, but there a lot of it is on the intent and the use of the language. If you're calling somebody a bird or a bib, it's pretty demeaning. Yeah. Okay. Um, Kevin, uh, another discussion, uh, another thing that's been banned this week, proved very popular in one particular school, and this is homework. Teachers said that we're going to ban it to yep. allow teachers to prepare properly for their lessons. Yeah, this is Philip Morant, a secondary school in, uh, in Colchester, and the heads decided that uh, actually homework doesn't work in the sense that teachers put too much effort and time into that instead of teaching lessons. Now, I've always been a fan of some homework. Uh, of course it is. But teachers' pet. I'm a kind, no, I think that oh, I'm pretty traditional in, in, in education. You've got to, le got to learn you. to read, write, arithmetic, get Why? all those Why basics. You, then? Get all those basics right, and homework has a role. But, but maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this 
experiment will work. Cheltenham ladies are not for the first it. time, Kevin. Well, Maybe you know, I'm wrong. If, if the kids actually do more at school, um, you know, yeah. then, then but, but also there are some people who think that it's the kids who are the least able or the kids who have yeah. the least support at home yeah. who are, instead of going home and doing homework, are just going to go home and sit in front of the telly yeah. for, for six Well, hours. the way you would tackle that is you would extend the hours at which the school yes. is uh, open and the teachers are there. I don't Indeed. think they've done it here. So right. those kids will still be left behind while the middle class kids will presumably go back to their music yeah. lessons. Right. Uh, well, thank you very much for taking mm. us through your papers. What about your ups and downs? We're starting with you this week, Kevin. Um, and you are sending up uh, Sea Cadets. This is one of them, but there were actually as a group of them from Glasgow who had a bit more of an adventure than they bargained they for. They did. This is Rory Hanna. They spent four, but sorry, a month uh, in the Ind Indian Ocean drifting around because their ship had gone bankrupt. The company owned it in South Korea. It was Liberian registered and they couldn't dock anywhere. They'd already been at sea for, for four months. They had to put razor wire around the outside of the ship to stop it being boarded by pirates. I mean, a terrible experience. Uh, but if they're, they're sea cadets, well, they'll be at great officers now and seafarers. Well, yeah, they've had great they only had nine Royal days Navy food left. Snap yeah. them up. Yeah, yeah fantastic. The Bless them. Resilience, well, they, yeah. They've made it back to, to dry land, safe and sound, with a bit more than they bargained for. Mm. So we're sending them up. Uh, you're sending down, though, the, the iCloud and the theft of Pippa Middleton's uh, images from, from her iCloud account. This it week. is 3,000 stolen, some of the royal family, her husband <coughs> without any clothes on. Oh, sorry, a boyfriend uh, mm. without any clothes on. Um, and you can see Beyonce. there's 3,000 3, of them being offered for sale for £50,000 to some newspapers, yours included, which of course didn't take it. No. But iCloud, people think it's secure, but it's not. And you ca it can get hacked, and that's a big problem for Apple because they sell themselves very much on the security of their but, systems. But also, I think a lot of people have iCloud accounts and they don't even realise they do. A lot of people yeah. have smartphones and have no idea that yeah. their photos are also being stored in this account. Yeah. That, you know, and they haven't set up any security settings, they haven't set up any passwords. Yeah. They don't know that it's I, out there yeah. in the ether. Yeah, yeah. They'll, 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 they'll never get me because I've never taken a photo on my phone. But I have to say, I <laughs> that's true. I interviewed Pippa Middleton for the mail, to, and the interview. Oh, oh hang on, two, name no, drop. No, Here's the it, name. It's, no, 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 it back. it's relevant. It Just two weeks yeah. before this happened, mm. where she talked about how her privacy was constantly undermined and how people were always trying to take photographs of her. Yeah. It, Right, so we're sending uh, the iCloud theft down. Uh, Andrew, you are sending up the uh, a I double agent. I love this story. Juan Pujol, also known as Garbo. Garbo. <laughs> he was a double agent and he was, did brilliant work and he was the one who persuaded the Germans that actually the invasion was going to be in Calais, not Normandy. But his wife hated being in Britain, hated the food, hated, hated the weather, hated being a spy. So I wanted to get <laughs> back to Spain and so she nearly uh, messed up the entire plans for the invasion. He went to such extreme lengths, he pretended he'd been killed so that she <laughs> wouldn't keep harping on about going back <laughs> to no. Spain. Anyway, all was re sorted in the end and he carried on his fine spying work. Uh, it's yeah. a great story. It's amazing it's because, a because even after the war, story. Um, the, the Germans were so impressed with him, they yeah. gave him the Iron Cross, plus he got the MBE yeah. from the Brits. <laughs> amazing character. Yeah. So yeah. We're, sending, we're sending him up and the story of his life. Uh, but you're sending down a uh, small talk at dinner parties. Yeah. Apparently we should ban it to make yeah. a better dinner party. And I as you would can like see, to as be you can at that dinner that, party. Well, that's one fabulous. of Kevin Maguire's dinner parties in his very posh house. Where are the in, rest uh, of the people? In, in, <laughs> in, in Kingston. Those are the days uh, when ladies really got dressed but up. But apparently small dinner. talk is very bad for us because um, it's bad for our health, according to this survey. Mm. And uh, so I don't know how the royals manage because that's what they engage in all well, the time. Well, yeah. So the, is the Queen going to be banned from saying, where do you come from? But, but I think this is interesting because there are all those subjects like politics and religion that you're meant to steer away from at the so they're saying that you should actively you should discuss get involved these in politics, the weather, England football, all that sort of stuff, and don't talk about the weather and yeah. and, and, and what do you do for a living? Yeah. Well, they, which is so a very boring. boring what it is question. is really talk about politics, but just don't shout at people. Well, don't you do all the time. Really well, you do all the time. It depends on the point of the dinner party, doesn't it? He depends came to dinner at my house. Days, listen, or over he came to dinner at my house. I had to put him in the garden. I think you were there. We had to put him in the garden. We were shouting so much. Except people have other views. This is my husband. Don't insult them. Right. So we're sending the dinner party down in polite conversation. Conversation. <laughs> Thank you both very much. And don't forget, do send us your nominations using the hashtag WNR. Well, thanks very much for joining us for our review of the week. We'll be back with much more next week. But for now, it's goodbye from them. Goodbye. goodbye. And it's goodbye from me. Goodbye. Thank you.